Today we'll be talking about ChIP-seq, otherwise known as chromatin immunoprecipitation sequencing. So let's start with some basic background concepts that you need to understand in order to really understand ChIP-seq. So as we've already discussed, ChIP-seq stands for chromatin immunoprecipitation sequencing. The CH is for chromatin, the IP is your immunoprecipitation, and then seq is sequencing. So to really understand ChIP-seq, we need to make sure that we understand each of these components individually. So let's start by understanding chromatin. So chromatin is essentially a DNA structure. So if you imagine that you have your normal double-stranded DNA that is in the cell, um, it needs to be consolidated, right? Because we have so many billions of base pairs and all of that DNA, if it was actually unconsolidated and open, would never be able to fit into our tiny cell. So it needs to be somehow wrapped up and packed so that it can actually fit into the cell. So our DNA goes from being this open, double-stranded structure to being wrapped, and it wraps around histones. So these round proteins here are histones. These are just special proteins that allow the DNA to wrap and coil around it. And together, this structure of eight histones plus DNA is called a nucleosome. And then that nucleosome is going to go and it's going to wrap even further tightly so that it becomes the structure of multiple nucleosomes that we call chromatin. And chromatin can be, as it says here, either pretty condensed and tightly wrapped, and that's called heterochromatin, and that's chromatin that's really not transcribed as actively because it's just hard to reach, right? It's so tightly wrapped around these multiple histones and wrapped into these nucleosomes that it's almost impossible for any sort of machinery to reach in there and transcribe the gene. In contrast, loosely wrapped chromatin is called euchromatin, and this is chromatin that is fairly open and therefore can be easily transcribed. So it's important to remember that euchromatin is your chromatin that is actually open. And so those are genes that are accessible that we can actually transcribe and use. And then this chromatin gets wrapped even more tightly and eventually end up with chromosomes, which as we all know, is the most tightly wrapped version of the DNA in the cell and it's the most consolidated. And that's really the form it takes when the cell is trying to divide. So the important thing to note here is that chromatin is a structure of DNA that can be tightly or loosely wrapped. And depending on it, how tightly it's wrapped, that can really affect the transcription of the genes within that DNA. So now that we understand chromatin, I want to move on to talking about antibodies. And this section, like I said, is background on the things that you need to understand to understand CHIP. So it will feel a little bit jumping around, but we just need to cover a few major concepts in order for you to understand how CHIP works. So let's talk about antibodies here. Antibodies are, you've probably all heard of them as the things that protect your body from pathogens or from viruses. And that is true, they do occur naturally, but we've also found ways to use them in the lab. And so now we can raise antibodies against any antigen of interest. So that means that if there's a protein that we want to study or a structure in the cell that we want to study, we can actually artificially produce antibodies that are highly specific to that structure. And that allows us to have ways to tag those structures or to study them even further. And so this is really what we use when we want to identify specific proteins or specific structures. So let's talk a little about the actual structure of an antibody. Antibodies are composed of two major chains. The blue chain you see here, because it's longer, is considered the heavy chain. And the red chain is considered your light chain because it's smaller. So that's easier, easy to remember. The light chain is just gonna be the smaller chain that's on the outside. The important part to remember is that this heavy chain and light chain will come together to form one antibody. And that antibody has two really important regions. So one of those regions is called the variable region, which is up top, and one is called the constant region. And these two regions have very, very different roles that it's really important to keep distinct and to understand. So the variable region 
its role is going to be to be highly specific to a specific antigen. So for example, if this was an antibody that we had made that was against the flu virus, then this part of the antibody would be really, really specific to the flu and would bind only to the flu virus. Or if it was something that we had made in the lab against a protein that we were interested in, then it would be really specific to that protein. So perhaps we raised an antibody against IDH1 because that's an interesting gene in glioma. Then our antibody is going to be highly specific to IDH1. It will always bind to IDH1. So that's the variable region. Very specific, varies from antibody to antibody, always depends on what that antibody is supposed to be raised against. In contrast, we have a constant region. And the constant region is a highly conserved zone, which means it's going to be the same for all antibodies that come from one species. So all antibodies that are from a human source are going to have the same FC. It doesn't matter. The antibody could be against the flu, it could be against measles, it could be against tetanus, but it's always going to have the same constant region. In contrast, if we had a mouse antibody that came from a mouse, that would also have always the same constant region as any other antibody that was made in a mouse. But it would not have the same constant region as an antibody that came from a human. So human FCs and mouse FCs are different from each other, but every single antibody made in a human is going to have the same FC. And every single antibody made in a mouse is going to have the same FC. But the specific region, remember, is always going to change. So that variable region up top is going to be really specific to whatever that antibody is made against. So this is really important because it allows us to do a lot of interesting things in research. So let's say we have a whole soup of proteins here. And let's say that this red one in our soup of proteins is IDH. So having antibodies that are highly specific like this allows us to really go in and from this whole soup of proteins, grab out the one that we care about. Because remember, this is how our body has developed a defense system. It's developed a system that can go through thousands of different molecules, thousands of different cells, and really identify the one protein or the one cell that's bad. And so although our body uses it to identify the bad thing, we can also just use it to identify something that we're interested in. So in this case, we're interested in, let's say this red one is IDH1. We've made an antibody against IDH1. So if we add our antibody to the solution, it's going to go ahead and bind only to our IDH1 molecules and not to anything else. So now that we have this, and we know, let's say that this was an IDH1 antibody that we made in a mouse. So we know that all of these constant regions are mouse constant regions. We can use a second antibody that binds specifically to mouse constant regions and attach it to our first one. And these chains of antibodies will allow us to specifically identify IDH1 and where it is or it can also allow us to pull out IDH1 and separate it from the rest of this soup of proteins. So antibodies have been used multiple ways. They're very, very powerful tools in research now, and it's very important to understand those two zones and how they can be used. So now that we understand chromatin, we understand antibodies, the next concept to understand is immunoprecipitation. And antibodies really go directly into this process. So immunoprecipitation, or IP, is a process where you use antibodies, specific antibodies that are raised against your protein of interest in order to isolate proteins. So this is useful when you have a protein that you want to know, you know, how much of this protein is there in this whole soup of proteins, or you want to isolate that protein, or maybe you want to know what else that protein binds to. And so when you pull this protein out of the soup, anything it's bound to is also going to be bound to it, and so you can also analyze those proteins. So that might sound a little confusing, so let's go through it step by step. So this is your protein sample here, and in this protein sample you can see that you have lots and lots of different proteins. Every single color is a different protein. And you can also see that you have these proteins that are forming complexes where they're stuck to each other. 
Now let's say that protein pink, we'll just call it protein P, is our protein of interest. And so we add to the solution a bunch of antibodies where the FC region is a mouse antibody and this region, the specific region, is going to be against P. So the way this would be written is mouse anti-P, which means it was made in mouse and it is against protein P. So when we add this, like we talked about, it's going to go and bind really specifically to these pink proteins, protein P that we're interested in. And we already used the fact that it has the same mouse region across the board to bind these beads to the other side. And these beads are just really heavy. And so what that is going to do is when we wash off all the other stuff, all the other proteins are going to get removed because the beads will sink to the bottom and everything else will get removed in the liquid. So really in between here, we end up with a solution where all of our beads are going to be at the bottom and then there's going to be just liquid here with the excess proteins. And we get rid of that liquid and we just keep the pellet. And so now we have beads that are attached to our protein of interest. And in this case, it could have been that the pink protein was not bound to anything. And so we would have just isolated our protein P or pink protein that we're interested in. And we would have seen, okay, there's this much in our sample. Or perhaps now we have this pure protein and we can use it for some other application. But in this case, our pink protein is attached to other proteins. So what we can also do now is analyze the levels of those other proteins. Because our pink protein, if this is our pink protein, it was bound to other proteins. We'll just call them A, B, and C. And so when we use our antibody to pull down this pink protein, we also pull down this A, B, and C because we can't disrupt those bonds. And that means that now we can use the fact that we know that these proteins were bound to our pink protein to see what the levels are. So what this tells us is that there was X amount of green protein, we'll call it protein A, bound to our pink protein, or there was this much of the dark purple bound to our pink protein. So it really allows us to see that when we pull down with this one protein that we know about, what are all the other proteins that bind to that protein that we might be interested in? And we can analyze that using mass spec, or we can analyze it using a Western blot so if we have a pretty good idea what those proteins are. So it does give you a lot of power to figure out what protein-protein interactions are happening or protein interactions with other molecules in the cell. Because when you pull down with that antibody against that one protein, you're going to get everything that was bound to that first protein. And that really allows you to analyze how it's binding to other things. And that tells you what it might be doing in the cell. So just to clarify that concept even further, like we just talked about, when you put an antibody against a specific protein, then you are going to pull down whatever that protein has bound to. So that could be another protein, which would allow you to identify protein-protein interactions. It could be a DNA sample, which would allow you to identify how protein is acting on DNA. Or it could even be an RNA sample, and that would allow you to see how the protein is acting on RNA. So we can use these antibodies as a really powerful tool to identify all of these different interactions that otherwise we might not be able to pull out of all the different things going out in the cell. But because we know this protein that we're interested in and we have antibodies against almost everything, you can buy an antibody against pretty much anything, we can be able to understand these interactions. So for example, for protein-protein interaction, Maybe the protein of interest is going to be this bad protein. And when you pull down, you would be able to identify that it you know, works with BCL2 or it works with Bax. In the same way, we talked about how histones modify DNA, and those are also a type of protein. So we can make antibodies against our histones, and then we can see where the histones are binding DNA more tightly and where they're binding it more loosely. And then in a similar way, we can do things with RNA. But today we're really going to talk about ChIP-seq, which is going to be the protein-DNA interaction. Um, but we did talk about proteomics last time, and we'll talk about Westerns in the future. And these are both ways in which you can analyze protein-protein interactions.
So we just talked a little bit about histones as an example, but I want to take a much closer look because histones are very important to understand. So we talked about how you start with your double-stranded DNA. And we discussed how if you just had all of that DNA open, it wouldn't really fit inside your cell. So instead, what we have to do is wrap it around something and coil it tightly. And so histones, there are eight histones. You have H4, H3, H2A, H2B, and then H1, which acts as more of an outside linker histone. These, you have two each, and so they form this group of eight, and that's what the DNA is going to wrap around. So you can see here we have a group of eight histones, and the DNA is wrapping very nicely around that group. And then there will be a little space, and then there will be another histone. So it forms sort of this beads on a string appearance, which you may have heard about. If you look at it under a microscope, that's what you see. Um, and the beads are basically our histones with the DNA wrapped, and then the string is the tiny bit of DNA in between. So these are really important because they form modifications on the DNA. So depending on what modifications are on your histone protein, that will control how tightly the DNA is wound around the histones. So for example, you could have beads on a string where you have a bead like every single gene. And so... This can never be transcribed. It's too tight. There's no room for transcription machinery to come in and even see a gene. But you can also have histones where it's very loose, where there's one histone here and maybe one here and so on, maybe one here. And so now there's lots and lots of room for the DNA transcription machinery to come in and actually transcribe certain genes. And so this is considered open DNA and this is considered closed DNA. And really what controls this is the modifications on your histone. So we talked about how there are eight histones, and this diagram shows some of them. It shows your H4, your H3, H2A, and H2B. And remember, these are your four major ones, and then you get eight by multiplying these by two. So if you think about the fact that you have these four histones, and then you have all of these possible modifications. So you can have acetylation of the histone, you can have methylation, you can have phosphorylation, and you can have ubiquitination. These are all modifications that you can have on the histone protein. And these modifications will determine really how tight or loose it is. So each of these modifications has a specific function. And depending on where it is in the histone protein, it can have an even more specific function. But what I really want you to focus on is two simple things. One is that acetylation of a histone means that it is open. So that means transcription is possible. We have this relatively loose beads on a string scenario, and this DNA is something that can be transcribed. In contrast, methylation is going to mean closed. And so this is very tightly wound DNA. The machinery cannot get in and there will be no transcription. This is very important to remember. These are the two canonical modifications. There are variations on these. There are additional modifications and there are details. But the really important thing to remember, if you remember nothing else, is that acetylation means open and methylation means closed. So for now, really focus on that. And if you get more into this field, then I would encourage you to read up on the very specific modifications and understand that, for example, there are H3 modifications, K27 methylation, for example. So this means that you have H3 histone has a methylation on K27 of the protein, and that really signals closed DNA. But then if you had a slightly different modification, perhaps it was on H2 or perhaps it's a different K that's methylated, that could mean something slightly different. But those are details that I would really encourage you to go into only if you're going very specifically into this field. Otherwise, I think the important things to understand are that acetylation in general opens DNA and methylation in general closes DNA. So we talked about histones, but there are other proteins that can modify DNA. And in general, that class of proteins is known as transcription factors. These are things that you've probably learned about in any standard biology class, 
but the idea is that a transcription factor is a protein. So this protein is going to be in your cell. Let's say it's right here. And it's a protein that's basically able to come into the nucleus and bind to the DNA and effect change. So it can promote the expression of certain genes or it can repress the expression of certain genes. And sometimes it has to function with multiple other transcription factors in order to strongly promote the gene. Whereas having just one or two of them would mean a weak promotion of the gene. So we have an example here that we can walk through. So here we have a circle and a star are activating genes or activating transcription factors. And our repressor is the stop sign octagon. Um, and so each of them has their own binding site along the gene. And this is your actual gene body. And so if, for example, you had both of your activators, then you have strong transcription, lots and lots of transcription. If you have only one, then maybe you'll get a little bit of transcription, but it's not going to be really active, strong transcription. And if you have a repressor bound, then no matter what else, you do not have transcription. So it's an important thing that they sort of function together to regulate transcription of the gene. And that can allow for really tightly regulated carefully express genes rather than just having a simple system of one activator and one repressor. So these are also proteins that are modifying DNA. And because of that, they're also proteins that we can pull down with antibodies and study even further should we want to. So while histones are one very common protein to study, transcription factors are also another class of proteins that are often studied in this way. And then the final piece of us understanding ChIP-seq is to remember that sequencing refers to next-gen sequencing. And this is the same kind of sequencing that we use for RNA-seq, DROP-seq, CRISPR, etc. We've discussed it in those videos, so I would encourage you to sort of go back to those videos if you're interested. But the basic idea is that you are going to send a DNA sample. That DNA sample is going to be fragmented, sequenced, and then realigned. And this is a process usually done by a sequencing core using Illumina machines. And while it's something that you should understand, it's usually not something that you will do yourself. Okay, so let's put it all together. So ChIP-seq, like we talked about, is chromatin immunoprecipitation sequencing. So chromatin, remember, is basically our DNA structure. Immunoprecipitation is using antibodies to pull down proteins that may be bound to other structures. And sequencing is our next-gen sequencing. So essentially, ChIP-seq is a way to measure protein binding. The IP allows us to measure protein binding to DNA. And it is usually applied to measure histone modifications or transcription factors and their effect on genes, right? And we're able to measure the protein binding because of the IP. And we're able to measure the specific DNA that it's binding to because of the sequencing of the chromatin. So just very quickly to go through the actual process, and we'll go through this in a little more detail. First, we're gonna start with genomic DNA. And this is DNA that is normal, double-stranded DNA that has some protein that we are interested in that is bound to it. This could be a histone, it could also be a transcription factor. It's some protein that is modifying our DNA. And to make it more manageable for us to use, we're going to fragment this DNA. So we're just gonna cut it into pieces so it's a little bit easier for us to work with moving forward. We're then gonna use antibodies like we talked about that bind very specifically to our protein of interest. And we're going to use that to pull down the pieces of DNA that have our protein. So in this process, these two pieces of DNA that don't have any protein on them are going to get discarded and only the DNA pieces that have our protein of interest are going to get saved and moved on to the next step. We're then going to wash off all of this protein and DNA and antibody, and so that we just have the DNA, right? So from this step to this step, we wanna get rid of the protein and we wanna get rid of the antibodies because really the whole point of the protein and the antibodies was to isolate the pieces of DNA that have that protein modification. Once we have those pieces of DNA, once we've gotten rid of the rest of the DNA, we don't need the protein or the antibody anymore. So we want to wash them off and we want to just have the DNA that we're interested in. And then just like before, we're going to send it to sequencing. Sequencing is going to occur like it always does. 
and then we're going to map it to our normal chromosome and we're going to figure out where in the chromosome was this protein bound. And that works because we, when we started at the beginning, we used an antibody to isolate only those pieces of DNA where there was a protein bound, right? The antibodies pulled out those pieces of DNA specifically and those are the pieces of DNA that we sequenced. And so if we match the pieces that we sequenced to the overall chromosome, we should be able to say that we had a lot of DNA sequences in this region. And that means that the protein was binding in this region. And so here, this is a peak that indicates our protein was binding in that region. And these are just more examples. So these are histone markers. This is a methylation marker, which means closed. This is also a methylation marker, that means closed. And you can kind of see that there are peaks at certain regions of the chromosome. And that tells us that those are places where a protein was bound. So these are places in the chromosome where the histone was bound really heavily. And that means that those are the places that were very tightly closed. So now that we understand all the major concepts behind ChIP-seq, it's actually fairly similar to all the other large-scale screens we've talked about. So this part should look very familiar to all of you. So the setup is very similar to everything we've talked about in the past. You're going to choose your model of interest, whether it is cells, mice, or tissues from human samples. You're going to choose some sort of condition, control, or experimental, and remember that these are just examples. There are many other types of samples that you can compare. For example, you could compare different cell lines to each other. You could compare a range of human glioma samples. You could compare control to knockdown or control to overexpression of specific genes. So there's many, many different sort of experimental conditions you can use. These are just common examples. So once you've done your treatment, you're going to extract the DNA with the proteins bound to it, and you're going to perform your IP pull down. And remember, this is with your antibody against the protein that you are interested in, and that will allow you to isolate those DNA fragments where that protein is binding. And then you're just gonna send those fragments to sequencing, just like we've done with everything else. So now after sequencing, our pipeline looks again very similar to other things we've discussed. So if you have questions on any of these pieces, I would encourage you to review the RNA-seq video where we really go step by step into each of these steps. But here I'm just going to give you a quick overview. So for ChIP-seq, just like RNA-seq, we're going to set it up and we're going to send it for sequencing. And this is next-gen sequencing done by usually an Illumina machine. And then when we get the sequencing file back, we're going to look at our FASTQC and our sample quality. And again, this is our quality assessment in general from the file. We're then gonna look at our count table. And an important distinction here is that this count table is not a count table of expression. So here, when we talked about RNA-seq or proteomics, we were always talking about expression. It was gene X and how highly it is expressed. But this time, this is going to be a genomic location. So it could be a gene, it could be a location within a gene, like a promoter location or an intronic location. And it's gonna say at this specific genomic location, there is a lot of binding. So increased in binding. So here, increased numbers mean that there's an increased amount of that protein binding to that genomic location, okay? And the way we represent that is with peaks. So if this is our actual chromosome. We're going to draw in peaks wherever the locations are where our protein was binding more. So this is our reference genome that we always have for all humans. We know what the reference genome should be. And we're going to align. We're going to look at our DNA sequences that we got back from our sequencing. And we're going to say, oh, all of our sequences are right here at this genomic location. And so that tells us that because all of our sequences are from this genomic location, that the protein must have been binding right here. And that's why all of our sequences are lining up to this specific place. And so we get a peak here. And so that's what peak calling and peak visualization are, is just us looking at those peaks. And it will give you how much of a full change, so how high is your peak essentially,
and it will also give you the p-value if you compare groups. And then from this, you can identify specific genes that you're interested in or specific locations that you're interested in. So this is just an example of IGV, which is the viewer that is used to look at this. So here you can see that this is your gene down here. This is ABCD6. This is the chromosomal location. So these are just standard human genome things that we already know that the program gives you. And then this is where you enter your data. And these are the peaks. So how high these peaks are is telling you how much binding there was of your protein of interest at that genomic location. So if we look at some examples, just to try to understand, let's say that this is H3K27 methylation. So that is methylation on histone H3, which as we talked about is likely a closed marker because it's methylation. So if this is our experimental, this red track, and this is our control, down here we have blue rectangles wherever there is a peak when there's a comparison to experimental and control. So you can see there's a peak right here and a peak right here. We'll get rid of those now that I've shown them to you. So we have two peaks that have been identified by the program as being significant. And then at the very bottom right here, these are the genes. So you can see that this is MYC. These are intronic regions. And this is usually the transcription start site or promoter at the very beginning. So if we interpret this, we would say that, for example, this peak, we can see that there is a peak in the experimental over the control. So it tells us that H3K27 methylation was higher in our experimental group compared to our control. So that tells us that in our experimental group, the transcriptional start site or promoter region is more heavily methylated than our control group is. That tells us maybe that this gene is more likely to be closed in our experimental condition compared to our control condition. And you can see here where you have a large peak in your experimental condition and relatively no peak in your control. And then just to look at a few more examples, so these are examples I just pulled from different papers and different websites. I just wanna highlight some important things. So one is that sometimes people include input DNA. And this is just sort of a blank DNA telling you that if there is this much signal, that's basically just noise. It doesn't really mean anything. It's a completely untreated, perfect control sample. And so, you know, your peaks that you see should be over input. You should see a higher peak than input to say that there is an actual peak there. If it's just the same as your input, then maybe there's a peak there, but it's not changing from like the baseline of how that sample always is. The other thing to note is that if you look at this one, for example, they've looked at methylation and acetylation markers, multiple types, and you can see that they all have a peak kind of in the same region. But we just talked about how methylation is closed and acetylation is open, so how can you have a peak of both in the same place? And the answer to that is that it's not as simple as methylation is closed and acetylation is open, and that's something to keep in mind always. And so you might have multiple marks in one place, and the reality is that these marks sort of function together and often influence each other and have more complex interactions than simply methylation is closed and acetylation is open. And so it's important not to get locked into that way of thinking that it's always closed or always open, but to evaluate all available data and really think about what this could mean and whether there are other possible interactions that are occurring. So finally, I just want to talk briefly about when is CHIP useful. So we've kind of talked about how it's good for looking at protein modifications on DNA. And what that really is, is the study of epigenetics, right? Which is when there are other things modifying DNA. So there's additional modifications to DNA that influence expression. So the traditional thinking is that you have genetics. And genetics is when there's a mutation or some sort of change to the DNA. And that leads to a change in expression. That's your very classical way of thinking. But more recently, we've thought that there must be some additional level of change that's occurring, a level that's sort of above the DNA that's creating change. Because every single cell in the body has the exact same genome. And so how is it that some cells express genes and other cells don't? There must be some other mechanism of regulation that is going on. 
And that's what we call epigenetics, which is when we have modifications on these histones that allow certain DNAs to be open or closed or transcription factors that promote certain DNA to be expressed um, or transcription factors that promote certain DNA to be repressed. So there's all of these other players that are acting on the DNA, like a second layer on the DNA that cause expression changes as well, right? So this also leads to changes in expression. So epigenetics is sort of the new thing that we're trying to understand and how that influences genetic modifications and genetic expression changes. And what we do know is that environmental cues can impact this. Microenvironmental cues from other cells can impact this. And sometimes cell growth and development can impact this as well. And so what the cell needs or how it's developing can impact which histones are modified and which ones are not. And so this is a really important thing to understand. And it's definitely something that's, you know, it's definitely changing in GBM and it's changing in other things as well. And understanding how it influences gene expression will be very helpful for us to understand how GBM is able to be so hetero heterogeneous and so plastic. It's likely because there are epigenetic changes. The genome itself in GBM is likely not changing that much, but there are regulatory changes and epigenetic changes that allow it to adapt so quickly to its environment. And so doing CHIP as an experiment and other forms of epigenetic experiments will allow us to really understand what those changes are. So to review, today we talked about the background concepts behind CHIPs. So this includes things like proteins and IPs, antibodies, chromatin structure, and then a little bit about histones and transcription factors. We also talked about basically how to set up a chip seek and how to analyze. And then we talked a little bit about how you interpret peaks. If you have any further questions, please feel free to contact us at any of these platforms. Thank you so much for listening today.